the South Haven Lighthouse on Lake Michigan is the next destination on painting and travel. Sarah visits the Michigan Maritime Museum and steps aboard the sloop Friends Goodwill. Roger uses acrylics to paint the lighthouse. Today, Sarah and I are in South Haven, Michigan, and right behind me here is Lake Michigan, and it's hard to believe that's all fresh water having grown up around the ocean down in Florida for so many years. Right behind me is a lighthouse. This particular lighthouse was built in 1903 and used to guide merchant ships between Milwaukee and Chicago. It also helped to guide ships up the Black River here into the town. I had hoped to do a painting here today, but the weather I believe is going to really start to deteriorate. It's cold, it's windy, and I think if I set up my easel here on the beach it probably would get blown over. So what I'm going to do is walk around the lighthouse, talk a little bit about the composition, and uh, take my digital camera, get some photographs, and uh, try and get as much information as I can right now so I can paint this back in the studio. Composition is sort of a strange thing because it's totally different than seeing with our own human eyes in real life. Because when we look at a lighthouse or a scene like this, we look at the lighthouse, we look at the tree, and we take a lot of different snapshots. And the human mind is good at taking a lot of little images quickly as we move our eyes around, and it puts all those together in a pleasing way. But if I were to take this, make it into a painting, it would be a totally different situation you would have no center of interest, or actually you'd have two centers of interest. You'd have the lighthouse and you'd have the tree. That would become a little bit disturbing. A painting, the eye needs to be led around. We need to show the viewer actually where to go. When I'm looking at this in real life, I don't need that. I can look at a snapshot of the lighthouse, the pier, the tree, and my mind puts those all together. That's not so with a painting. In a painting, we have to deal with composition because we look at it as a whole. We look at it as one whole piece. Well, compositionally, this is a little bit better. And the reason is the subjects are a little bit closer together. The lighthouse is a little bit closer to the tree, but it's still too far apart. Another strange thing about composition is the center of interest does, is not always dictated by the size of the object. The lighthouse in the background can be very small and the tree in the foreground can be very large. And since the lighthouse is what we consider as a human interest, it's what captures our imagination and attention, that's what becomes the center of interest. So the center of interest is not necessarily dictated by the size of the object. Well, this, at least to my eye, is a much better composition. And the reason is, is that those two objects that fought with each other before, I didn't know whether to put my eye here at the tree or the lighthouse, now those have become sort of one group. Even though they're two objects, they're sort of attached to each other visually. And even though the lighthouse is much smaller, it still remains the center of interest. Over there, the perspective of those catwalk posts were compressed quite a bit. Over here we can see them a little bit better. Now the question is how to accurately draw one post and the next post and the next post and keep them in an accurate perspective. And there's a simple formula for doing that. First of all I need to find the horizon line. It just so happens that the bottom line is exactly on the same plane as the bottom of the concrete pier. If I were to climb a few steps on a ladder, we'd see the water and the actual horizon, but the wall is right on the same plane. I'll draw a line running down the top of the walkway, and I already have a line at the bottom. These two lines will always come to a point on the horizon. 
In this case, the vanishing point is far to the left and out of the picture plane, way out here. Then I'll establish two vertical lines where the posts from the boardwalk come up from the concrete. The first two posts always have to be established first in order to determine the correct placement for the third post. Next, I want to find the halfway point on the sides of this rectangle. I'll use a ruler to measure halfway up each post, and I'll mark it here in green. I'll show you why this is important in a minute. Now I'll run a straight line through those center points. This line, too, will hit the same vanishing point on the horizon as did the top line. The next step is to draw a line from the top right corner through the green dot. As you can see, the orange line falls exactly where the next pole should be. I continue dissecting it, and each time I do this, it falls exactly where the next pole starts. Well, as you can see, it's really too windy here to set up. And uh, so I'm gonna take my digital camera, take a number of photographs, especially over here where I think the composition is best. And I'll take these back to the studio and do a painting. In the meantime, I know Sarah's in the downtown area where I believe it's a little less windy. We'll see what she's doing. This morning I wanted to take a walk and I noticed that from where Roger's set up about a half a mile from here at the lighthouse there's a river walk and so I took it and I wound up here at the Michigan Maritime Museum and there's a very handsome vessel here as you can see. It's named Friends Goodwill and during the summer months you can go out for a ride, you can even hire it and have a wedding on board. But now the season's over and the down rigging is taking place. Well, there are two types of rigging on the, on the ship. Uh, what's called standing rigging, which as you're looking at it is generally the stuff that's painted black. And it's structural supports that stay in place all the time. And then there is running rigging, which is used to operate the sails. And down rigging for the winter generally involves taking down all of the running rigging and uh, some of the spars that, uh, that support it. And uh, next weekend, probably taking down the jib boom, which is the tan uh, uh, extension on the bowsprit here. And that will leave uh, a basic stub rig, we'd call it, that uh, will stay in place all winter. Is there any chance to get a quick look at the interior? Oh, certainly. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Okay, let's go take a look inside. <laughs> Your head because there's not much room. Okay, a little oh bit of room gosh. Right there, but, oh. but that's where it ends. Uh, well, this is the captain's cabin. It is uh, actually modeled after an 1830s Great Lakes shipwreck. So it is, it is uh, uh, pretty close to what uh, the captain or the passenger would have expected in this type of ship uh, at this time. There are two berths all the way aft. Uh, they have little windows and little working desks in them. Uh, uh, before the captain and the owner, uh, and cabinets, uh, obviously a table here in the middle which, uh, on, on which the captain and the passengers would have taken their meals, and uh, two more berths right here, which on the original vessel would probably have been passenger berths. Oh gosh, that's not much uh, room there. You can't even sit up, you just... No, you, uh, you slide in and slide out. This is uh, set up as a cruise quarters. Uh, presently, we have eight bunks down here where a uh, crew can sleep. I see. All the way forward up here, we have a galley. Uh, this is a little fancier arrangement than, again, the original ship would have had. Uh, but the original ship might have had a wood, uh, a cast iron wood burning stove, something like this. Uh, our original ship, we think, probably just had the uh, stove stuck in a corner down here in the hold 
and the cook managed as best he could. Mm -hmm. Eric, thank you so much for the tour. I really appreciate your you're taking time. Welcome. I know thank your crew you is ready to today. have you come back and get them uh, with the down, help them uh, with the down rigging. Okay. So we'll say goodbye for now. Thanks All a right. lot. You're very welcome. We've arrived back here in St. Augustine, Florida, which is our home and studio, and I've taken a few minutes to draw this lighthouse from a reference photo I took while we were on the site, and I have my computer monitor set up over here to my left, and that's what I'll use as a reference as I do this painting. I like to use my computer monitor mainly because I, it gives me a little bit clearer picture, and the main thing is I can zoom in to see details if I want to, and I can't do that if I print out the image. So I'll just put my board up here. This is eighth inch masonite board and covered with gesso. I'm only using three colors on my palette today. Ultramarine blue, Indian yellow, and alizarin crimson, and of course, titanium white. I find that these three colors, although very limiting in some ways, gives me all the colors I really need to, to complete a painting. And I can mix these colors in one small area and uh, by changing just one or two of the colors, I can really keep using the same pile of paint all the time here, and then just add white if I want it lighter. So I'll get started here. I like to start with my dark colors first, and often I'll just dip into these three colors just to get a real dark color. I tend not to mix my colors a whole lot on the palette, especially here at the beginning, because this will give me a variation of greens right here that I wouldn't get if I just mixed my paints thoroughly. And then I can just leave a lot of that texture that's already on there. I really don't have to play with it. Grabbing some white here, ultramarine blue. If I use just ultramarine blue and white, it's gonna give me a sky that's just too much out of the tube, and I don't want that. So I'll just put a little bit of red and a little bit of yellow in there. And that, see, that just grays that down. Just graze it just a bit. As I paint here, I had this boardwalk drawn in, and as I put the paint over it, I lost that drawing. So I'm taking a little bit of water here, wiping it off my brush, and thinning that out just so I can see these lines here. I don't want to lose those. Now I'm going to do something down here in this beach that's really kind of fun. I'm going to mix up this beach sand color here. And as I look at my reference photo, it's a very warm color. Okay, now what I'm going to do here, I'm going to do two things to this painting right now that will work only if I time this just right and work quickly. Now I'm gonna mix up some color here that's color of the sand on the beach and uh, we'll put that on there. Now I'm going to have to work very quickly when I do this because what I'm going to do here is try and create the look of some rocks and pebbles. So I'll just scumble this on here and I'm going to do two things to create this effect I want which requires just pretty exact timing. First thing I'm going to do is take my atomizer and I'm going to spray this. I'm going to squeeze it just lightly because if I squeeze it hard, I get a very fine mist. If I squeeze it just a little bit, I get droplets of water out there. And that's what I want, some droplets of water. I'll take this big brush again, be sure it's very dry. Now this paint in the background has to be wet and I'm going to drag my brush over this really lightly. 
And as I drag my brush over this, it's going to pick up those little droplets of water that have absorbed the paint I just put on here. Now, if I do this too soon, it's just going to blend the, blend the water in with the existing paint. I have to wait just long enough where those little droplets of water absorb the paint and I can pick them up with this dry brush. See, if I go over this again, I, it starts to blend. Now at this point, I just have to stop at least picking up the droplets of water I put on here. I do have a second chance to put some more droplets of water on there because the background paint is not totally dry yet. So I'll just do that and see if we can do that. Okay, I squirted it a little bit more. It only takes a few seconds really for this, these droplets of water to absorb the paint. There, you see? I've got even more of those textures in there now. Now that automatically gives me some nice texture in here that I don't have anywhere else. It gives me those look of pebbles. Now the second thing I'm going to do is mix up some color, not the color of the sand, because what I did here with the sand is I painted the sand color, I just sprayed the water on there, and it took away the sand color and left me with the white background. But here, I'm going to spatter or splatter some little dark spots. It's kind of good to use a stiff brush when this is done. And what's going to happen here, if things go according to plan, is basically the same thing. These dark spots here are also going to absorb the paint but it's going to give me a different effect. Now, where this is different than the droplets of water is, hopefully, what's going to happen here is I'm going to pick up these dark drops of paint. They will also leave a spot on the, on the board, but since I have pigment on those rather than just water, when I drag my brush to the side, it's going to pick up that droplet of paint and drag that paint to one side, creating what hopefully will look like a shadow. So we're going to have to wait just a minute or two. There we go. Just right timing here. Now I'm going to just really, a very light touch has to be done with this. But here you see, I keep wiping this brush off just with the lightest touch. I'm going to drag that. Now whichever way I drag that, it's good, going to determine the way the shadow goes. So what we're left with is these little tiny spots of rocks and we've created it like an instant shadow on each one of those. Now as long as this is still a little bit wet and I think it's a little bit moist in here today or something, so this is not totally dry. I can keep doing this. There. Remember where those drops of water were running down? Well, it, they sort of blended together as I painted. Now I sprayed a little bit more water over that, and that area, that trouble area there, disappeared. So I end up with a result here that looks like I spent hours and hours and hours doing these little rocks with the shadows, but actually it was just done with this uh, simple solution here. I just discovered that by accident many years ago. I was painting and this just happened, you know, it was one of those aha moments where I thought, wow, this can, be, this can work for a lot of things. So I've been using it uh, on and off for quite some time. Now all these small choices have to be made, which really will bring the painting to life. It's not much of a painting with these big shapes, but if I didn't have these big shapes to begin with, the painting would not 
would not look very good. I can't start out by putting in the details. I have to start in, start out by putting in the big shapes. And the shadow side of these boulders here is going to be a little bit cooler because it's getting the light from the sky. That's what makes it cooler. Mixing up some more sky color and can put in a few negative areas here and there. And I mix this color for these sky holes a little bit darker than the sky itself. You can see right here, you can see this, it looks, this color is a little bit darker than the sky color. This, these two colors look just the same, but this is actually a little bit darker. See that? It's darker than that. But when, it, when it's put inside, it looks the same color. Now, if this were lighter, it would not look quite right. All these sky holes need to be a little bit darker in color, or a little bit darker in value, I should say, than the actual sky. Otherwise, they will look a little bit too light. I mix up a dark color here, and I'm going to put in some of these tree trunks. And there's a bunch of them here. Now, I can't see those hardly at all, but what I am seeing is my brush stroke. It's, the brush stroke is just a little bit different. Now, I'm not putting these brush strokes in, these tree trunks in, so I can see the tree trunk. I'm putting them in as a guide for where to put my negative areas. It's really important that I vary the shapes of these negative areas. What I'm doing right in here is I'm expressing the shape of the tree trunk more than I am express, expressing the sky. The sky around this tree trunk here, and leaving what looks like branches and limbs. But after that, I can also go in as well and put in more branches. So I'll mix up some dark color here. I'll just mix all three of my colors together. Then I can add branches, smaller branches, over these negative areas. And we'll put a little bit of this lighter color in here, trying to give this a little bit of form. I don't want to get into too much description on this tree because I want the center of interest still to be focused down here. So I'm going to leave this tree fairly simple, I, I think. I'm going to use a small pointed brush. We'll just sort of draw the outlines of those rocks there. Now we'll add some highlights and maybe a few more shadows. Well, I guess it's time for me to get my ruler and uh, work on this boardwalk. I'll take my three colors here. Just make a really dark purplish color down there. So here we've got this main deck to this boardwalk. Oh, and I always hold my breath when I do that. <laughs> I load my brush up pretty full and it's fairly loose paint so I, it'll flow off the end of my brush. And I just use my fingers here as a guide. Use this finger and can just run that along there. Now we've got another support bracket down here. A little bit thinner, I'll do the same thing. Run that. I'm not getting too fussy with these lines because I want to maintain a degree of painterly feeling with this piece. There's some light poles or something like that in here, so I'll put a few of these in here. It's easy to get a part of the painting like this looking too architectural, like an architectural drawing, and I don't want that. So I'm just going to really just sort of mess up some of these lines to give it a more painterly feel. Okay, let's put the top on this lighthouse. Now since I'm using transparent colors, I will have to go over this a second time when this dries. I have to get this lighthouse accurate. If it's a little crooked or a little off, it will uh, ruin the whole painting. <laughs> this side of the lighthouse is catching the light. Now I've put white in that alizarin cr crimson, so that makes this opaque at this point. On this side, I'm going to mix some ultramarine blue, a little bit of white, and I'm just going to put a little bit of 
that light blue on this side. The uh, water was a little bit rough down here because of all the wind, but I think it might be nice if I had a little bit of a, a reflection down there of the lighthouse. And I'll go back and hit that water again. Careful not to make that too blue. Oh, of course, if I'm going to see a reflection there, the first reflection I'm going to see is of the seawall itself. So I better add that first before I put the reflection of the lighthouse. Then I'll just, with a dry brush, drag it across here, and pick up some of that paint. Then maybe just with a very soft touch, soften that just a little bit. To finish this painting, I'm going to add just a few more details. I've added a few more rocks in here, tightened up the detail on those, added a few more leaves up into here, worked on the lighthouse just a little bit, and put some waves on the shoreline. That really finishes the painting. But of course, it's never finished until it's signed, varnished, and a frame goes on it, because a frame really says this painting is finished. So we'll do that now, put a frame on it, we'll see what it looks like. For more information about painting and travel with Roger and Sarah Batsimer, visit paintingandtravel.com.